see us healthy. Mom, this is propulsion on Pluto One. Go ahead, prop. Propulsion is nominal. Tank pressure is 176.8. Mom, this is power on Pluto One. Go ahead, power. Uh, power system, all telemetry is nominal. Hardware is healthy. Copy that. Nominal for power. Uh, Mom. Uh, Mom, this is thermal on Pluto One. Go ahead, thermal. Uh, thermal reports nominal. Uh, all, all temperatures green. Copy that. Thermal is nominal. All temperatures green. Okay. PI, Mom on Pluto One. We have a healthy spacecraft. We've recorded data of the Pluto system, and we're outbound for Pluto. Yeah. Well, we kind of hate to stop that live TV. It's very exciting. Um, but we have, I think, an also a very exciting presentation for you this evening. So welcome to Cafe Scientifique, Silicon Valley. I'm Alice Resnick, Vice President of Corporate and Marketing Communications for SRI International. Uh, some of you may know, tonight is the last cafe to be held here at SRI. We've been very, oh, thank you for that. <laughs> We've been very proud to host the cafe um, since 2007 as part of our commitment. Well, thank you for being here. <laughs> um, <clears throat> the cafe's really reflected our commitment to science communications and to outreach to our local community. Um, we're uh, also very excited, though, that after eight years here, the cafe is going to a new location. So I'd like to welcome uh, Roger Whiting, who's the founder of the cafe in Silicon Valley, and will tell us about the new location. So. Well, the first thing I'd like to do is thank SRI. They have been fantastic hosts for Cafe Sci now for eight years. And, you know, when we first started Cafe Sci, we started out in a location that held about 40 people, and we've had up to nearly 300, and that's really been with the overflow and everything that uh, SRI's given to Cafe Sci over the years. So, a really ever so special thank you to everybody at SRI, because they've made, really made Cafe Sci much better than it ever was. Thank you. So we're relocating to Hannah House on University Avenue uh, in Palo Alto. Uh, that's the old Borders um, place and uh, downstairs. Uh, Blue Bottle Coffee, I am told by uh, aficionados, is some of the best coffee around. So you can, uh, you'll be able to experience that. And we're going to have our first cafe side there uh, in September. The exact date's not chosen at the moment, but it, we'll put it out on the, on the web. So um, enjoy tonight's uh, absolutely appropriate uh, uh, presentation and uh, look forward to seeing you in September at our new site. Thank you. Yeah, this was random. 
thanks, Roger. Thanks for bringing the cafe to SRI, <clears throat> excuse me, and giving us the opportunity. So uh, tonight, we're very pleased to welcome our guest speaker, Dr. Olenka Habitsky of San Jose State University. Uh, Dr. Habitsky has taught physics and astronomy at the university since 2008, and she was named their outstanding lecturer for 2014. For 25 years prior, she studied planet formation at NASA Ames Research Center, and her research there is ongoing. She also serves as director of the Systems Teaching Institute at NASA Ames University Affiliated Research Center. We're very lucky to have here tonight as views of Pluto, and as you've seen, um, these views are being seen for the first time. So she'll take questions at the end of her presentation. We'll have microphones set up in the back in the aisles, so please use the microphone so everyone can hear you, and we are um, videotaping the program, and we will post the videotape on YouTube afterwards. So uh, let's welcome Dr. Olenka Hobitsky. Good evening. Um, it's amazing that today, we picked this date randomly a year ago. So I cannot believe that, first of all, I'm closing down the place. Uh, and then second of all, that um, today we just saw Pluto for the first time um, as a little NASA brat for, since graduate school and having grown up with the space program, staying up, watching uh, Shepard wait for hours today take off. I can't believe this. This is just the most extraordinary thing that um, our humanity has ever done. I also want to point out that your tax dollars did this. And NASA gets one-tenth of a penny of the discretionary tax dollar that goes to Washington. One-tenth. And this is what we can do. And we do it over and over and over. And See, you sneezed on the truth. Over and over and over again. It is extraordinary. So let me just pull up my um, PowerPoint. I got kind of sidetracked by. OK. Um, I'd like to start off with this uh, slide, even though I've been introduced, because I want to include all the collaborators. No one works alone. Um, um, the, the late Dr. James Pollock is the one that kind of brought our group together. And he and Peter Bodenheimer at UC Santa Cruz have been working on planetary work before I joined. And they built up this group that we were very lucky enough to um, bring together and to perfect so that the rest of the community is going to accept um, uh, this, this model that I will be presenting. Um, I'll bring up this slide again because collaborations are incredibly, incredibly important, especially in astronomy, because we can't do it on our own. Um, so in honor, of, um, in honor of Pluto, how come? Ah, I just want to remind you where Pluto is. And just so that, in case you haven't been poring over the astro uh, sites all week to learn about Pluto, I want to show you how, what an extraordinary little object this is. Little. Well, it is little. Um, it's part of our solar system. Uh, whatever its name, it doesn't matter. That's what I want to really make clear. Um, even my students, when, when we bring up the whole thing, oh, why isn't it a planet? Um, uh, I, I give the usual analogy that it's like the ugly duckling story. Um, it never really fit properly in what it does in our solar system. Um, and then when it finally realized that it's a swan, right now we have two big ponds to play with. We've got the classical planets to play with and the dwarf planet and the Kuiper belt object planets to play with. And we've got more the merrier. So. Um, New Horizons kind of really brought that up. So uh, let me just give some facts about, um, uh, about Pluto. Uh, the location, it's very far away. And it's very, very cold. It's got a very, very different kind of an orbit. It's very eccentric. Most of the planets in our solar system are circular. Uh, that's why the, uh, the, um, the, the, the Middle Ages could get away with figuring everything out on a circle until Kepler. Um, 
it's, um, let me just use this pointer. Uh, it, it's close. Uh, it's as close as 20, 29 AU. Now, an AU is the kind of ruler that astronomers use. If we start putting out, you know, billions of miles or 100,000 miles, all you see is zeros and it just doesn't make sense. So our basic unit of scale is one. And one astronomical unit is the average distance from the Earth to the Sun. So what we do is we compute all those zeros and convert them into astronomical units so we immediately get a visual. So when you see that something is about 30 AU, you know that it's 30 times further away from the Sun than uh, we are. And most of the planets, they stay in their lanes and they stay their distance. Jupiter is at 5 AU all the time. Saturn is at about 10 AU all the time. Uranus and Neptune, they keep, they keep their distances, but not Pluto. Pluto gets in as close as 30 AU and as far as 50 AU. And not only that, all the planets go around in an ecliptic, meaning they all go around in the same plane. And when I describe how they were made, it's all a remnant of physics, just plain old physics and con uh, angular momentum conservation. And so what we've got here is a planet that is inclined to the ecliptic by 17 degrees, which is substantial. So right there, we always knew that it was different. Uh, it was near enough to, um, to be part of planets, 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 until we found another object very similar to Pluto. And then we had to start thinking about, mm, you know, maybe we ought to go find the swans for this ugly duckling. And we did. It's cold. I don't even think thermals could help us here. Um, it's uh, on, the, on the scientific Kelvin level, it's 35 degrees Kelvin, warms up to about 55. In uh, Fahrenheit, about minus 400 uh, degrees Fahrenheit, even colder than Wisconsin. <laughs> so it's, it's cold. Well, no, a few winters ago, Wisconsin was colder than Mars. Uh, for a few days, so it, it, it gets cold. Um, uh, the size, okay, the size of Pluto is really quite interesting. Um, the classic is 600 to 700 miles. We know the mass, the mass could be very nicely calculated using Kepler's laws, and its gravity is 1 15th of, of, of the Earth's. So that means if you weigh 135 pounds here on Earth, you can weigh nine pounds on Pluto. Not a bad weight loss. That was true until yesterday. Yesterday we found out that Pluto is bigger. And that makes it um, uh, uh, the biggest object in the um, um, dwarf planet category. Before it was Eris. Eris is, uh, was the other object very similar to Pluto. And when Eris was discovered, that's when people had to reconfigure their, their definition. Um, the mass doesn't change, so the, Pluto's gravity, so now you're going to be weighing a little less, eight and a half pounds. Um, so we have to switch that, switch that diagram to go from so now it's the moon, because what we have here is a picture of the moon and on, on over here. And so Pluto is this gold-like gold planet, so, and this is Eris. We've got to flip them around. Now, Pluto has five moons, and uh, Charon is the biggest one, and you could see how big it is. It's almost half the size of, of, of Pluto. And that, again, makes it different from any other kind of planet in our solar system. No other planet has that kind of a ratio. In fact, Earth and our moon has the largest ratio of moon to Earth that, in all of the, the ones that have planets. So um, again, there's an indication that Pluto is special. Um, what's it made out of? Um, ice. You know, if it's going to be... Th uh, 55 degrees Kelvin, you know, 400 degrees minus uh, Fahrenheit, you know it's going to be cold. So um, 
uh, uh, even the gases are ices. Uh, Neptune and Uranus, they're closer in and their surface can be more like slushies. So next time you go to 7-Eleven and you, or you order the blue slushy, think Uranus and Neptune. That's, you know, that, that's kind of the surface features that it has. Um, we're going to learn a whole lot more. I should probably have a lot of brown crossing offs here because everything is going to be really quite different from now on. Um, for the longest time, Pluto was compared to Triton, and that's a picture of Triton. And Triton is a moon that's going around Neptune. Now, just in case you don't know the order of your, the planets, Neptune is the planet that's closest to Pluto. So it goes Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and then Neptune. And Neptune is what, uh, um, Triton is one of the, uh, the only moon in the whole solar system that does weird things. Everything, everything orbits around in one direction, and we kind of define it to be counterclockwise. Not Triton. Triton orbits clockwise. Um, and it's very different from everything. So the belief is it's possible that Triton was a caught object, a similar object to uh, Pluto. And so that's why people were expecting Pluto kind of like this. Well, we're going to see. We're going to see. Another interesting thing between Pluto and um, Pluto and Charon is that they have a, they have a, a very strange choreography. Uh, in the solar system, you have resonances. It's a ballet. It's a pas de tour between two objects. Um, the Earth and the Moon have that. The Earth, uh, the Moon rotates uh, on its axis in the same amount it takes to orbit the Earth. And that's why we only see one side of the Moon. We've never seen the far side of the Moon. First time we saw it was in the 1960s when the Soviets sent a probe to circumnavigate the But we'll never see the, unless we go there and visit, hopefully soon. Um, and Pluto and Charon, it's even stranger because uh, Charon will orbit Pluto once in six, six, and chain, six days. But Pluto rotates in six days. So if you've got, what, what we see here are two blue people and two red people. So if the two blue people are on locations of Charon and Pluto, um, they will always see each other. All the time. All the time. Same place, same time. Whereas if people, the red people, won't see anything. In other words, the red people at Charon doesn't, doesn't even know that Pluto exists unless he moves. And the red person on Pluto doesn't know that Charon is there unless he moves. Thankfully, it's a small planet. They can drive over easily and <laughs> take a look. No worries. OK, this is our first view of Pluto. If you were watching the, uh, the, um, the NASA TV, they were giving a biography of Clyde Tombaugh. And these are the first pictures that he, that he took. Now, I'd like to mention also Percival Lowell. Percival Lowell was an extraordinary astronomer. He got a lot of things wrong. Uh, he was the one that was convinced that the, there were Martians and canals on Mars from his ob observations of Mars. He also believed that Pluto was, well, he believed that Neptune's, Neptune's orbit kind of wobbles. And he was convinced that there's another planet that makes that planet, uh, makes Neptune kind of wobble. Uh, but Pluto isn't big enough to do that. So, um, that, was, that didn't work out so well. But when they named Pluto, everybody kind of liked the idea because the very first two letters are the initials of, of, of Percival Lowell in honor of him. So uh, you know, there's, there's so much you know, culture in, 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 in things like this. Um, the, in case you didn't see where, now what astronomers use this kind of a technique. It's called a, um, a, a blink comparator. We use that to find novas. We usually use to find comets that are moving. Anything that's fast moving or fast changing, you take a picture of the sky at the same place at different times. And then you just go back and forth, back and forth and blink. Well, the machine does. You don't have to do that to see if there's any changes. So in case you missed it, there's Pluto. 
And you could see from the geography here, you got these two big objects over here, and Pluto is over here. Well, it's not there anymore. And this is what he presented when he said, I found Pluto. It's got to be the most incredible experience to, to find something like this. Our next good, oh, just in case you missed it, there's Pluto. And, <laughs> and that's an enlarged picture of Pluto. So um, we didn't see much. Um, once uh, Hubble came online, uh, astronomers were able to get a little better view. And it's about as good as it got. This is um, kind of an animation made of a whole bunch of pictures that were taken of Pluto uh, while it was rotating. And you could see there aren't that many features. However, you do see the bright spot. And I think the uh, newspapers called it the whale on the bottom, the dark spot. Uh, this is a nice picture of Pluto and Charon. And here are in uh, the, the, um, the moons, Pluto, Charon, and all of its moons. And that's another thing. These, these, these objects just kind of move in, in a group. Um, it's it's going to be fantastic the next few years to, to be listening to what the uh, planet scientists come up and, and, and show us. Um, just, I, I've got Hubble's picture up here for a comparison. This is a few days ago of Pluto. And it's listed, uh, a very good website for all of these kind of things is called uh, space.com. Uh, it really is top of the line. And I also really like Alan Boyle on MSNBC. Uh, he's a science writer. And that man does such a great job in being right there when everything is happening and explaining things. He's really, really. So if you, you know, you'll always get good news from these people. Um, there's also Karen. We've gotten pictures of Karen. And then yesterday, we got this picture. And I was hoping to download today's picture that, that of closest approach. Now, notice this is um, a half a million miles away. And this morning, at about 5 o'clock in the morning, New Horizons was about 8,000 miles above Pluto. 8,000 miles. I mean, with that kind of resolution, you're going to be able to pick out you know, your ski lodge where you want to be, uh, on which crater, and in what kind of landscaping. It's, it's, it's exciting. It really is. See? I didn't get it. Um, just to give you the speeds of what's going on. And again, these speeds are nothing more than kind of what Newton figured out with F equals ma, and what you learned in physics class, uh, to get off of Earth. And now New Horizons had to get off really, really fast. Now, I'm a theoretical astronomer. Most of my work is, all of my work is on a computer and numbers. I'm not an engineer. I walk into a lab and all the instruments shut down immediately. So I'm just quoting. Um, but I'm not sure why they had to move fast, but they moved fast. And uh, 36,000 miles an hour to get off of Earth. It got a gravitational boost when it passed Jupiter. And so, you know, you hear 13.8 kilometers a second, but what does that mean in real numbers? So 30,000 miles an hour. And this morning, uh, these are the speeds of what Pluto was doing. So it was crossing Pluto at 13, uh, 30,000 miles an hour, and relative to the sun, just a little bit more, 32,000 miles. It's going fast. But it still took nine and a half years to get there. So um, you kind of get an idea of why it's called space. A lot, a lot ago. So it traveled uh, about 32 AU. So it's 32, um, uh, 32 times further away from the sun than we are. And uh, the signal takes almost nine hours to get uh, to us. So the signal was at 4 o'clock. And right at 6 o'clock, when you had to listen to me, you know, instead of looking at the pictures, you know, well, we'll see it on the 11 o'clock news, I'm sure. Okay, so let's get to the topic of this. Um, by the way, making planets, we have to figure out how to make Pluto and, you know, why you have the variation in here. So this isn't too bad of an, uh, too bad of, uh, uh, an introduction. 